All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Hacker Tool. So uh, today we're going to go through data wrangling, which is kind of a continuation of uh, the previous Hacker Tool session two weeks ago, which is uh, the CLI, the command line interface. So uh, please do download the data at uh, this URL, which I've also sent to the chat. And you can also download the slides. So uh, they're all actually inside uh, my GitHub repository. So uh, later on, we are going to be playing around with this data set so that everyone can be on the same page. So uh, yeah, if and if you have any question along the way, feel free to just uh, either write on the chat or like unmute yourself and ask your question if you have any question. So yeah, uh, I guess I'm going to start now. All right, so some introduction first. So uh, uh, basically this Hacker Tool session is uh, one of the initiatives that, uh, one of the events that uh, NUS Hackers organize. So NUS Hackers is basically, uh, we're an interest group whose mission is to spread a hacking culture. So here hacking as in like hackathon, so where you build stuff. So we try to uh, encourage people uh, to build stuff, including by uh, organizing Hacker Tools so that people uh, know about the tools that uh, you can use to build uh, systems and stuff. So uh, Hacker Tools is one of the, events that we organize. Uh, there are also a couple of other uh, events that we organize. So for example, every Friday, I think now it's every two weeks uh, because of the COVID uh, and everything, but uh, we have Friday Hacks, which is a series of technical talks where we invite people either from the academia or uh, from the industry to give a talk about like some interesting thing that they did or they built. We also have Hack and Roll, which is our annual hackathon, usually happening in January. Uh, it's basically a 24 hour hackathon uh, that we organize. And there's, yeah, feel free to uh, join it. The next time it happens, we also have hacker school, which usually happens on Saturdays. Uh, and that's also another kind of workshop that we do besides hacker tools, but uh, it's mainly catering for beginners. So like if you have no experience, prior experience at all, uh, that hacker school is the right events to go to. Whereas for hacker tools, we sort of assume a little bit of uh, background knowledge before you attend. And yeah, so uh, about myself, I'm Julius. So you can uh, look at my GitHub. I contributed to like a bunch of open source softwares. Uh, so I'm currently in year four. And one of the pro like some projects I do did includes Fluminous and Fluminous. So uh, those are basically uh, command line tools you can use to download files of Luminous. And yeah, as I'm graduating soon. So if you are interested in becoming a maintainer, just feel free to let me know. Uh, so I'm, I hopefully, hopefully, uh, this has been communicated to you, which is basically, uh, in order to follow whatever that's happening today, you're going to need like a Unix like environment. So either Linux, which I believe, uh, is what the first hacker tool session was about, or if you have a Mac OS or any other kind of Unix like OSs, you should be good to go. Uh, if you run Mac OS and you run into problems later on. Uh, please run uh, this Xcode select dash dash install. So I'm just going to send it to the chat. Uh, yeah, this might be required, but if everything runs properly, then you probably don't need to do it. Okay, so uh, what is data wrangling, which is like the topic of today? So uh, data wrangling is basically uh, looking at some data set, which is a bunch of text, and then you want to do something with it. So it's basically uh, you have some kind of like pipeline where you adapt the data from one format to another until you end up with exactly what you wanted, like what kind of information you want out of those data, uh, which is a very simple definition. So again, uh, we're back to the Unix philosophy, which uh, I went through in the previous Hacker Tool session, which is the philosophy of the tools that uh, people are supposed to follow when they uh, write tools for Unix. So the first one is to write programs that do one thing and do it well. So they don't want this kind of like big kludgy software. They would rather you have just one tool that just does one thing. And then you write these programs to work together, which what we're using in this uh, current scenario uh, to build our data pipeline. And then uh, we write these programs to handle text streams because that's the universal interface. And because uh, each program handle text stream, we can use this text to actually direct them to other programs to further uh, process them. So uh, we can go through some basic data wrangling. So uh, 
just like last week, if you are not sure about like any commands that we're using, which is the first word that appears, you can always use the man, uh, the man command, which is, which is short for manual. So for example, if you don't know what cat does, you can always go to your command line and then do something like man cat. And then uh, it would tell you what it does, like concatenate fast and print. So basically print files on set output. Uh, so in this case, we're using this. Okay, so if you're on Linux, I'm pretty sure you can follow this. So uh, if you run this, uh, oh no. Oh, okay. Wait, what? Ah, typical. Uh, Let's run it here. Yep. So, uh, for example, uh, yeah, I think this should work on both Mac OS. And if you're using a uh, common enough distro, uh, my Linux box is running on Next OS, and I don't think they have uh, this particular path. But uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So this command basically what we're doing is cap, which is basically printing the content of this thing var log sys log, but uh, so this is the system lock. So like uh, whenever the system is doing something or whether there's something that exited. So for example, in this case, like I'm running Mac OS. So you can see that like some service exited because of some signal, uh, it would write to the lock, to the system lock. And here we're using grep. So uh, if you're not sure what grep is, we can always do man grep. So file pattern searcher. So basically you can provide it with some pattern and then uh, it would match the text against the pattern and print out whatever pattern that matches. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, Elvin has a question. Okay, he answered it himself. Okay, great. So in this case, I want grub dash i. So what does dash i do? Uh, we can always go to grub and search for dash i. Uh, so dash i means ignore case. So we want it to be a uh, case insensitive because by default grub is case sensitive. So in this case, we're doing a search for today's date, which is September 22nd. So uh, if you do that correctly, and then uh, you're not supposed to see anything. So if I go print head, which is, uh, I just want like the first 10 lines of it, then you can see that actually uh, the earliest possible uh, output is actually from September 22nd. There's nothing that's from September 21st, for example. Uh, hopefully people are all right so far. If you're not okay, just write something in the group chat or feel free to unmute yourself and uh, yeah, just give a shout out. And yeah, so this is an example of the Unix philosophy. So each of these programs like CAT and GRUB, they just do one thing. So CAT is basically focused on uh, printing files and GRUB is focused on pattern matching. And because both of them are using text streams as the input and the output, they can actually uh, be combined to work together using pipe. So if you remember from last, uh, from two weeks ago, uh, all pipe does basically redirects the output of the command to the left as the input of the command to the right. So uh, yeah, so what you need in the case of data wrangling is basically first a data source. So in this case, the data source is the log file and it's something to do. So in this case, something to do is uh, pattern matching with the date of today but you can definitely do like a lot of other stuff that we're going to cover later on. And a good use case actually is for locks because sometimes there's some bug or like uh, you are deploying some stuff and then it doesn't work quite the way you want it to or it just crashed or something like that and you want to investigate this failure. But sometimes these lock files are really, really huge. Right? As you can see just now, it just prints out like a long list of lines and you don't want to investigate you don't want to read everything because what you want is just like some small thing out of it. And this is one of the most uh, useful use case for data wrangling. So from this point on, I'm going to use my own data set. So if you click on the link that I sent to the chat or in the very first slide, uh, you will get a zip file. So if you uh, unzip, if you extract the zip file and you're going to get uh, this file, so like the file lock and a directory TMP with a lot of files inside. And the for, for the very first data wrangling example that I'm going to do, so uh, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend some scenarios is happening and then uh, we're going to learn how to do those stuff using uh, the tools that we have at our disposal. So uh, say the problem that we want to figure out now is I want to know who are trapped who's trying to log into my server. Uh, 
it's uh, probably a pretty common problem that people would face. So uh, what you can do first is to look into the service log. So in this case, I provided a log as the file log. So you can do cat log. So if I do that cat log, you're going to see that like, I mean, it was a very quick scrolling, but you can see that it's actually a lot, a lot of stuff. And you don't really want to go through all of this. Uh, like it's way too much. And you're just trying to figure out who's trying to log in. And you can see there's like a couple of things. So like, there's like uh, when the server was started and then here is actually when someone logs in, right? So it accepted public key from the user curry from the IP address with this port and uh, with whatever key. So this is actually what we want, but there's also a bunch of noise in between. So like it started the server and it received a disconnect from uh, whoever was trying to connect and that sort of thing. And then there's even this thing where like, uh, yeah, UFW block. So like someone, well, this is my firewall blocking uh, some attempt at brute forcing my server. So probably what we want to see here is the SSH stuff. So SSH stands for secure server, a uh, secure shell. So you, this is basically the tool that you use to lock into someone's server. So what we can do is we can cat lock just as the first time and then, uh, you can grip SSHD. So SSHD is for uh, the SSH daemon. Daemon is basically like the some service that runs in the background. So you can try running that. So cat lock pipe to grip SSHD. And then uh, you can see that it's actually a lot shorter than just now, especially because all the noise are gone. Like the noise are from those where like, uh, oh yeah, it started this service or there's some firewall blocking and that sort of thing. But now, every single message here are actually only has to do with the SSH daemon. So like there's the login event, there's a disconnect event and all those sort of things. But actually what we're interested in is only this kind of lines, like something that's very, very similar to this. So we can definitely do better. So uh, after we grab for SSHD, we can then uh, add another pipeline to it and then add another pipe to grip where the uh, what we want is actually accepted public key for. So if I do that and then I grab to accepted uh, public key for, and then you need to uh, quote it because uh, otherwise bash would split it by white space and it would see it as like three arguments instead of just one argument. So if you do this and then you enter and then you can see that all the disconnected events just disappear. Like the only ones that would appear are the ones that fulfill exactly these two criteria. So you can see that a grip does filtering and you can even like uh, make the text go through multiple filtering. So this is what I call like sort of like the pipeline because uh, you keep on piping things over to another tool that does other things. Hopefully uh, everything's okay so far for everyone. So all we do, all, all, all we've done now is basically filter off the lock from something that's really, really huge into uh, something that's more manageable. It's still huge, but more manageable. So uh, there's one tool that you can use to know the number of lines. That's basically uh, this command. So WC dash L. So WC stands for word count. So it prints like new line word byte count. So all sorts of count of the input. But if I use specifically dash L, then it, prints the new line count. So like how many lines are there in the file, basically. So I can actually show you, so from cat lock, so like how long, how long is lock actually? You can see it's like 9,144 lines. So what happens after we grab SSHD? You can see that it goes down way a lot from 9,000 to like about 1,600 lines. And then when we further do another uh, set of filtering, oops. Uh, only for the accepted public key for, which is what we want, uh, then it drops even more into like just 461 lines. So this is basically sort of like the filter you do so that you can turn like a huge amount of data into uh, this thing. So there's a lot of noise here. So you can see that uh, there's this like prefix that is not really helpful if all you want to do is just to know who's trying to log in, right? There's this sort of things is keys, which you're not interested in also in this case. So we have a lot of ways to try to get rid of that, but we can take a look into like one of the most powerful tools that we usually have, which is SEV. So 
Uh, I mean, I, I, I didn't finish this slide, but basically this can be useful when you are exploring code bases. So uh, uh, like whatever we're doing just now can, as, uh, can also be applicable to exploring code bases. So you have a new code base and you want to explore your way around, uh, you can use uh, like grip basically to look for uh, whatever uh, you're looking for. Because usually uh, when you look at a code base, you're only interested in a very specific part of it. So SED, so what is SED? Okay, uh, if anyone has any question, like feel free to just like uh, post it to the chat. So SED is a stream editor that builds on top of ED. So uh, ED editor is the OG editor for Unix. Basically, uh, you give uh, short commands on how to modify the files, but it's a very, very old system. It's, uh, I believe it's a line-based editor. So it it's still there in every single uh, modern installation of Unix, I believe. So if I man ED, yeah, it's still there because uh, it's just something that we had since a long time ago. So that's on Mac OS. And then if I go to my Linux box, okay, it's not installed. Well, it's a Linux OS, but usually it's installed. Uh, but basically, if you're, if you're familiar with Vim, you should be familiar with some of the commands because basically they share the same uh, heritage of ED. So Vim is actually the visual mode of ED so that you can see more than one line at a time. Uh, and another fork of ED is SED, where instead of like taking in uh, files, it just takes in streams because uh, these are basically all text streams. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of commands, but the most common one is S for substitution. So if you've used Vim before, you would know that you would use like colon, you add some specifier and then you add S slash something. So this would look very, very familiar for you if you have done Vim before. So this is the command that we're gonna try, which is uh, we print the lock, we grab for SSHD and accept the public key for. So these three uh, are basically uh, what we've done so far, which is filter for the lines that contains the usernames that we want. And then, uh, so what we want to run is this particular command, which is substitute this thing, this pattern with empty. So, yep. So from here, if I do this and then I enter, whoopsie, is there something like the public key for? Yep. So now you can see that it's a lot cleaner. You can see that whatever uh, was in the beginning. So if I don't do this instead, Okay, let's do head two lines from there and two lines from the one that passes through SED. You can see that it's a lot cleaner. So here we still have these prefixes that we don't really care about, but here the prefix is gone. So, wow, magic, it's a lot cleaner. So what's happening is actually uh, this thing in between the slashes are actually regular expressions. So uh, this is the S command in SED, which is that we use S and then uh, the, the delimiter is this slash mark. So uh, the first argument is the regular expression that you want to search for. And then you replace it with some sub substitution. So like whatever text you want to substitute the text with. So S is kind of like find and replace sort of thing, if you're more familiar with that. And you might be wondering like, what is the regular expression? So it's actually, very, very powerful constructs that let you match text against patterns. It's very, it's quite common and it's quite useful so that it's actually worthwhile to take some time to understand how they work. And usually they are surrounded by slash. I mean, not always, but usually. So most characters just carry their normal meaning, which is like whatever you want to search for. But some characters have special matching behavior. And there are actually like a couple of different flavors of regex and Mm, it can be uh, frustrating, but like the most common ones are this. So you can have dot, which would match against any single character except new line. You have slash, which would basically uh, do kind of like a repeat of the preceding match. So if you do like dot star, then it would match against either zero of dot or many of dots, like zero, one or many. You can have question mark, which is like one or more of the preceding match. You, have, you can also have square brackets, which is any one of the characters inside. Or you can have uh, this or sign, which is like either something that matches like this regex or that regex. 
uh, you can also add uh, this carrot sign in the beginning, which is basically uh, signifies like this should match only on the, at the start of the line. Or you can have dollar sign at the end, which means that it should only match against the end of the line. So if you're actually unfamiliar with regex, I suggest that maybe after this session, uh, you can play around with regex1.com, which provides pretty uh, good lessons on regex. But uh, whatever that I've gone through just now here should actually be uh, good enough for today's session. Uh, so as it is like the default sets regex is actually kind of weird. And it actually requires you to put like a backslash before most of uh, these things that I've listed. So what's happening is they are using these things called like obsolete regex, which is like the very, very early version of regexes. And if it's gone through some, uh, some different uh, like changes and what you want to use is actually the modern regex format. And to do that, you can pass the dash E flag to SE. So uh, if you do that, it will then switch to the modern regex format. And there are like a couple of differences. If you're very interested, you can run this command like man re underscore format. And then it would actually show you like, uh, like the details, like the actual technical document on the regular expressions and how they are different. But it's not really important. I think what you should learn is just the modern regex format because that's what's used in most programming languages as well. So if you look at the regex that we wrote just now, so uh, this thing inside SED, so you see there's a dot star accepted public key for space. So this means that any text that starts with any number of characters, because dot matches against one character, but I put a star to it, which means that uh, the preceding match repeated zero or more times. So in this case, this matches against any character zero or more times, which means that any number of characters can be zero, can be one, can be two, can be many. And after that, it must be followed by accepted public key for space. So in this case, it's uh, kind of tricky. So like, what if the username is also accepted public key for? Then uh, it's not gonna work. So for example, uh, I can take this. So uh, I can do echo this and then it should print that. But now uh, let me change the username to accepted oops, public key for. And then after this, I pass it through this command. Oops. So what's happening here is that both are gone. So in this case, if, I mean, this is a very weird username, but like some people might do this in order to like hide their username or something like that uh, whenever you do this. So it is, it is like this sort of like edge cases which might not work. So what's happening here is actually because by default, regex is greedy so what happens is that they would try to eat like eat as much character as they want when you do this sort of like match like matches against any character they will do it as many as they could so in this case uh when they see this uh when they see this line what they're trying to do is they would like try to match as much character as they could before they finally meet accepted public key for so in this case they will keep on eating even into here because they can still they can still keep eat, eating it, and then there's another accepted public key for that is coming later. So this solution, uh, when you apply it, 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 a username probably wouldn't contain a space and that sort of thing. But uh, if you're doing this for the other stuff, then you might be missing some cases because of these edge cases. So we can actually do better by matching the whole line. So if, when you when the format is actually more specified, then you can know for sure that like it wouldn't match against unwanted things. So uh, if we replace this set with uh, this thing, so set dash E, dash E for modern regex. And then uh, I'm just gonna, for now, I'm just gonna copy paste uh, this long line of things. Oops. What's happening? Okay. This, and then last one is this. Okay, so this is the comment that we're matching. And then you press enter. Whoops, they're all empty. So uh, I'll tell you why later. I mean, it's kind of clear why, because I'm replacing them with like empty substitution. So, uh, but uh, what I want you to see here is like how this works. So, okay, let me open, uh, look at this using using a regex debugger. Okay, so hold on. Uh, 
move this here. All right. So yeah, you can just click on a slide and then like open that. Uh, let me send the link to the chat. So this is a pretty nice website. So it, regular expression, regex 101. Uh, and it will actually show you like, uh, like what's happening with regex. So regex can be actually kind of hard to understand. And there's, they have this like sort of like explanation, that sort of thing, so that you can know what's happening. So for example, here you have accepted public key four, blah, 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 uh, with the first capturing group, second capturing group and everything like that. So the start is still as before, which is dot slash. So it matches any character zero and unlimited, between zero and unlimited times. And it's greedy. And then it literally accepted like accepted public key for literally. And then you have the first capturing group. So capturing group is, uh, it's basically marking some parts of the regex as like something that you can use uh, later on in the substitution. So uh, you can see that the first public, the first capturing group is any character zero or many times. So that in this thing, you can see that the first capturing group is colored differently here, which is colored green. Match one, which is the which stands for like the first capturing group. And you can see that all the usernames here are matched, including if it's accepted public key for. And then it follows with from, and then you have another capturing group uh, because of the parentheses. And then inside here, I'm actually writing a match for uh, IP address. So IP address is basically like this, uh four numbers separated by a dot that's actually between zero and 255 but you can't really match it with regex so i'm just going to match against like any number that's possible and then uh, followed by port number which is basically between zero and nine which is like the character set of a number a, di a number digit and then i put plus on it which matches between one and unlimited times followed by this specific text and then i don't really care what happens next so uh, hopefully this is clear to everyone who's following about like how regex work. Uh, yep. Oops. Oops. What did I do? Okay. Great. Uh, I'm just gonna refresh. Oops. I don't know what's happening. Okay. Cool. Yep. So. Yeah, so as I as I was saying just now, so uh, the star is similar, and then any string of character which signifies the username, and then uh, the literal like uh, characters from, and then followed by the IP address, which is the second capturing group, followed by port, and then a sequence of digits, which is uh, the port number, and then we try to match on the suffix RSA two five six, followed by any string of characters. So using this technique, you can see just now that this username accepted public key for is also matched. So this is kind of tricky. Like this is something that you should care about when you're writing regexes because by default it's greedy. So it can be very tempting to just like sort of underspecify and then like you accidentally match against something that you don't want to or like you don't match against something that you want to, you, you want for. And like I said just now, actually the IP address regex is not really what you want because this matches like for example, everything with nine, which is not a valid IPv4 address. I'm going to leave like a regex that only matches valid address as an exercise. But yeah, oh no, the entire lock is not empty. So you can see that when you run this exact command, because uh, we're leaving the substitution as an empty thing, it would just like leave everything empty. Every single line is replaced with an empty string. But we want to keep the username and as I told you just now, we use capture groups, which is like a text match by a regex surrounded by parentheses so that you can refer to it later on. Capture group zero is special. So it's basically the whole text that is matched by the regex. So, uh, but the matching group is that you create yourself by using parentheses actually is available by like the first, second, third, and so on. Uh, matching groups, depending on like which one appears first. So the first matching group, like the matching group appears first will be the first matching group. And the second one is the second matching group and so on and so forth. And you can actually access this inside the substitution using backslash. So if you want the capture group zero, then you can do backslash zero, which is just the whole thing, which is like sort of useless in this case. So if I do a backslash zero and enter, you can see just prints the whole line again, which is yeah, kind of useless in our case. But you can see that 
if I use backslash one, so remember first matching group is actually the username. So if I do this, very nice. Now it only prints the usernames, but you can also do, you can also use like the other matching group. So like matching group two is the IP address, right? Uh, this is the IP address. So if I do this and then you can see it's just all the IP addresses, or you can also get the port numbers only, which is the third matching group. And then you will get this. And then if you use a non-existent matching group, it would just be an error because there's no such thing as a matching group four. Okay, uh, this is kind of like a lot of thing to uh, understand if you've never used regex before. So if you have any question, feel free to just uh, post it in the group chat or you can unmute yourself and just say it out. That works as well. Oh yeah, and then uh, uh, an interesting thing is that sometimes this reference group is even available in the pattern itself inside uh, the engine. So uh, using some engines, I believe like the one that Perl uses, which is PCRE, you can actually re refer to like something that you just defined later on. So it's all kind of wacky, but it's not really important. Uh, yeah, so what we want is the username, which is the first matching group. So we just do backslash one. So again, if I do backslash one, then we're gonna get just the usernames, which is like much closer to uh, where we want, which is removing like all this noise first. So like the first part that we're doing now is just like trying to remove all the noise and get into what we want. In this case, a list of users. So yeah, hopefully everyone's good so far. Okay, uh, please feel free to like uh, stop and ask questions if you want. It's not quite this. So I'm gonna go through awk later on. So Alvin asked, it looks like awk print dollar one. It's not quite print dollar one because uh, I'll, I'll go on later on why it's not that. But basically dollar one would just print the first field. And the first field is, uh, Aux separates by its field separator, which in this case is space. And if you look at the uh, output here, it will just print 21 every time. So I, I can try that, but it will just print 21 many, many, many times simply because, uh, yeah, it just prints that. So print dollar two, it will just print 21 many times simply because there's all the dates. Now it's the second column because dollar two, dollar, Aux dollar one, yeah, dollar one is the first field, yeah. So it's going to be much in this case. But yeah, so what we want now is just this. Print the first matching group. Yep. All right, cool. So yeah, uh, it's just like more regular expression. You can actually come up with like very, very uh, complicated regex. So uh, if you learn theory of computation, this is not really what they mean by regular expression because uh, in most real life regex engines, they've added some features that makes it actually not a real regex in the theoretical sense. But uh, yeah, those uh, they are there for like convenience. And because of that, they can actually build like really, really uh, complicated regex. So for example, uh, someone has made a regex check for prime numbers. Someone has even like made a regex that can match ABC with A plus B equals to C or like to match nested brackets. So like uh, I've included this in uh, the links here, but note that please, please, please note that these are only for curiosity purposes. So like, please, please, please don't write regex in real life to actually do this because that's just asking for trouble. But yeah, if you want to, I don't know, go for hack and roll and win like the most useless hack, maybe you can do this. Uh, yeah, so for quick and dirty, usually we do this more for like quick and dirty script. So like when you are doing things on the fly and you want to like match some things, in a very ad hoc manner, you can actually write some like quick regex. So there's been a couple of accident, like incidents that's caused because of regex. There was one time when Cloudflare was down because there's some bad regex that just consumes all the computing power. So yeah. Uh, so if we go back to our data ranking, so now we have this. So we first print the file, we filter for SSHD, and then we filter for accepted public key four, and then uh, we do this substitution using set. But actually, set can actually do all these things for you. So uh, 
in like in this case, I'm actually passing two commands to SED. So S SED dash E, which means like use um, the modern regex, and then the first dash E is actually like uh, run this command. Every time I give a dash E, it means like add this thing to the command list. So what I'm doing is I'm matching against this pattern. So again, remember, whenever we have regex, usually it's delimited by two slashes. So this is the regex, which would just accept, which would just match accepted public key for. And then I do bang D. So D stands for delete, which if you use Vim, you should know there's like D, which is delete. Uh, but there's a new thing here, which is bang. So what bang means is we want to apply the function, which is this delete function but only to those lines that is not matched by this. So only to those lines that is not matched by accepted public key for, which in effect is basically filtering for whatever is inside here. So if I do this, uh, so this is the second command, and the first command is basically accepted public key for bang D. And then I don't even need the group anymore. So if I do enter, then I will get exactly the same result. So it first filters only for accepted public key for. So like whatever doesn't match this would get deleted. And then we do the substitution uh, where we only want the first matching group, which is the user username here. Okay, hopefully everyone is everyone can follow so far. So if you want to know more about like the different kind of set uh, commands, you can check out man set. And then at the bottom, I think you would find like there's a, there's a lot of like commands, but I think the most useful one is usually S for substitution because that's how like you can access a regular expression directly from the shell. All right, so that's sort of like the basic data wrangling. And then now we're gonna go through like some more advanced data wrangling. So yeah, uh, if you have any question, feel free to just uh, ask away. Don't be shy. So now, oh, what's the S slash? Okay, S stands for substitution. So there are like a couple of commands. In this case, the command is S, which is substitution. And then the slash are just the limiters for regexes. So the next thing that we want to do, let's say we want to look for like, what's the common username? So like in this list of like, who logged in into my server, I want to see like who logged in the most, something like that. So we can actually pipe it on to sort this command sort, which would, well, basically sort the input. And there's this command called unique. So unique would actually uh, collapse consecutive lines that are the same into a single line. So if you have like, like A, B, 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 C, then it would just turn it into A, B, C, because the B appears like, uh, B appears multiple times consecutively. And then I add dash C, which means I also print the count. So uh, for each of this, for each of this like uh, line, unique lines, they would then print like how many times it actually appeared. So the reason why we can't pass the data directly to unique is because it would only collapse consecutive lines that are the same. But if these lines are the same, but like jumbled up everywhere in the file, then it wouldn't actually uh, like collapse them. So for this thing, let's say we pass it to sort, and you can see that it's actually sorted, right? So Turing, Newton, Julius, Hoare, uh, Einstein and something like that. Uh, yeah. And then if I pass it on to unique, just unique, then it would just print, it would just collapse all the same lines that appear, uh, appear consecutively. But if I add dash C, it will actually print how many times each of them appear. So there's curry appears 88 times, Einstein 76 times, so on and so forth. And then we can also see like what happens if I don't, uh, if I don't call sort first, I just do unique dash C. Then you can see that actually, like Julius is actually unique, but it appears multiple times because unique will only collapse consecutive lines. So if they're not consecutive, then uh, it would just appear multiple times for unique, which would make sense in terms of like efficiency of the command when you think about it. All right, moving on. So. Uh, now that we know like uh, how many times each person logged in to the server uh, in this time span of this log file. But what if we want to know like what's the most common login? So in this case, we can sort of see like, oh yeah, Kari is probably the, the most uh, followed by Hoare and then followed by Einstein, but, oh, sorry, Turing, sorry, yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, but 
if you have many, many, uh, if you have a much longer list, it will be more difficult. So what we want to do is actually we want to sort the input again, right? So we can pass it on to another sort. So uh, in this case, what we want is a numeric sort. So uh, the difference between numeric and lexicographical order is more apparent when you have one and 10. Sorry, yeah, one and 10. So usually what, or like two and 21, so, uh, like you have like numbers from one to 20. So if one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, something like that, which I can actually do it by the command SEQ. So if you do man SEQ, it would like print a sequence of numbers. So if I SEQ 120, then I have these numbers. So you see that if you sort by lexicographical order, what would happen is that it would go to one and it would go to 10 instead of two. So if I sort, just sort, it would actually sort by lexicographical order, which doesn't do it correctly because it would just block, it, it would just like group together all the ones. What we want is dash n, which is numeric sorting, which would then like regard the input as numbers and then it would sort correctly, which in this case is what we want. So dash n, and then we do dash k1, which means that we only want the, uh, we want to sort by the first column. So uh, in this case, what is defined by columns is actually white space separated. So uh, if I print the unique again, you can see that there are two fields here separated by spaces, right? So this is the first field and this is the second field. So what we're saying is that we want to uh, we want to sort only by the first field. Well, actually it means we want to sort by the first field and then if you don't say anything afterwards, it would try to, uh, it, it would then like follow on to sort with, by like uh, until the, n field and if this n is not specified it would sort until the last field uh in the line so in this case because there's only two field if i just do uh sort uh k1 that it would sort by this and then by this so if there's a tie it would then try to break the tie by using like the subsequent columns so uh just to be correct here we should specify comma one because we only want to sort by the first column and the first column only but in this case, it doesn't really matter because uh, we can sort by the whole line and it, it just doesn't matter because like uh, all the lines are supposed to be, uh, the second column are supposed to be unique. So it doesn't really matter. But yeah, just for the sake of correctness. So if I do this, you can see that it's now sorted in increasing order based on the first column. And then if you only want, say the top three, we can do, do like that, like pipe to tail M3, which is only print like the last three lines of it. So if I do dash tail, uh, sort to tail, I don't have R here. Oh, you're asking whether there's a difference between this. Well, I, I suppose the R will be taken as, I think there will be a syntax error. There isn't, oh, there, there isn't, okay. Well, I mean, in, usually in this case, you don't really want to, yeah, it would just be, it would just do dash r, which is reverse. But uh, I wouldn't suggest you write this sort of thing because it can be kind of ambiguous in terms of like the short flags combined together. Whether like one comma one is part of the k and that sort of thing. In this case, I like, didn't know that uh, the input for dash k has ended, and then it would just take the r as another flag. So there's no difference here. But it's sort of like some ambiguity. So yeah, don't try not to. Yep, so tail dash n3. So this is like the three most common usernames. So uh, suppose we want the least common ones. Yeah, I mean, that's basically the exercise, which is like, it's the most common, you want the least common. So you can do two things, which is like either you reverse the orders if you dash r, then you're gonna get like the three least common ones. That's one way. Or another way that you can do it is you can do head dash n3. Then it's the same thing, except you want to take like the first three lines of the last three lines. But yeah, uh, yeah, that's basically exercise. Either use head or tail. You use head in the tail or use sort dash r. Well, you can do man head and see what it outputs. It's basically the opposite of tail. Yeah, whenever you don't know what a command does, just do man head.
Okay, so that's pretty cool, right? Like we can we can finally uh, get this. Uh, hold on. Yeah, we can get this output, uh, and you can see this. Like you can get this like very very nice list. But what if you only want the usernames and maybe like not one per line? So this is where awk comes in. So uh, it's just gonna look magical. But if I do awk and then I use this paste, then the output just one line and they're all like common separated instead of like new line separator, which make it easier to see like everything that's going on, right? So let's start first with paste. So it lets you combine lines with a dash S uh, and then you combine them by a given single character delimiter. So in this case, the single character delimiter is comma. So by default it's new line, but if I change it to dash D comma, then it would change it to a, uh, to a comma instead. And then ask it to read from standard in. So this is a kind of like a standard a convention, if your input file is dash, that means that read from standard input, which is what pipe does, right? It redirects the standard output of the previous command as a standard input of the next command. So there's actually another possible way, which is to use the tr command. So if you look at tr, translate or delete. So in this case, we translate, which is like basically kind of like replace the character. So we can do that as well. So we can do tr, replace the new lines with commas, right? But this results in actually like a trailing comma here because, uh, well, that's what happens when you replace the new lines with commas, right? But what we want is actually to just like paste them. So like you only want things in between each line, which is why uh, paste is actually better here. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the paste part, which hopefully is easy enough to understand. I mean, there's, there are many other uses of paste, which you can look up the man for, but like in this case, we only use the paste in order to uh, combine the different lines with a single character delimiter. Now, what's interesting is to go through the awk part of it, which is uh, yeah, what Alvin asked uh, just in the beginning. So uh, awk is actually a, programming language that just happens to be really, really good at processing text streams. So if you want to learn awk properly, there's actually a lot of things to say, but we're just gonna go through the basics here, which is like why awk is very useful is because you can use this sort of hack uh, where you just want to print the second field. So remember, uh, like I said, column, I said field, those are kind of similar, which is like white space delimited fields. But the basic syntax is basically this thing. So you, you define a pattern, and then uh, you have curly braces and inside you put a block, which is like what you want to do. So the pattern is optional. So if you don't specify the pattern, it will just match against the whole line. Yeah, if no pattern is provided and it matches all lines. Uh, and then this thing must be provided, which is like what to do against the pattern. So dollar zero, quite similar to regex matching groups, dollar zero is actually set to the entire line's content. So like similar in, uh, regex, so it's set to like the entire content. And then dollar $1 to dollar $n is set to the nth field of the line separated by the field separator. In the default one is white space, which is why this works. Cause like if I just do this, you can see that there's two, uh, there's two fields here. The first field is like the number of text it appear. And the second one is actually the usernames. Pattern is regex pattern. Uh, you can use regex pattern, but they are special ones. So. Uh, I'll, I'll show you later uh, the, special, the special patterns for awk. For example, an empty pattern is also special, right? Because it matches against anything. So if I do print dollar two only, then you can see it actually prints just the second field. And if I do print dollar one, it only prints the first field. And if I print dollar zero, then it prints the whole thing again. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone's okay so far. So, Remember that awk is actually, okay, so a uh, more fancy one. So this, uh, this is like the special pattern sort of. So like the pattern can be not just regex. So for example, we can make like, uh, we say like the sec this, this part is actually a uh, regex pattern. So we want the second field to match against this regex pattern. But you can, we can also say that like, oh, you want the first field to be exactly one. So. In this case, like what we want, we, what we're trying to do is we want to find the number of single use usernames that start with R and ends with T. So, if you are not sure what this does, we can always like take this and then put it here. 
So uh, caret means that the position is at the start of the string. R matches literally R. And then it matches strings that are not present in the list below, which is space. So like anything that's not space appear zero or many times and then ends with a T. So uh, if this match these two exact criteria, because we're using an AND operator, then it would only then print the second field. So uh, yeah, if I copy paste this into this, uh, oops, print two, then you can see that it only prints root and rust because uh, they both start with R and ends with T and appears only one time. matches the tilde is matches so like it's, it's the operator for matches against regex so this the left hand side is uh, like the, the left operon is basically like what you want to match against and the right operon is basically the regex for it and then uh we can use wc dash l which i explained just now which is the kind of number of lines in the output so in this case we can know the number of like users actually matches against this uh, by using this But awk is actually a programming language. So we don't even actually need to use wc-l. So we can do this. So you can see here that there are like some special patterns. So like begin is a special pattern, right? Uh, which means that it starts, uh, like this matches before the start of the input and end matches after the end. So what happens is that before we start taking the input, we would match, uh, we would set rows to be zero. Uh, dollar one equals equals one means that the first field is equals is exactly one. So do, dollar something dollar n is it means like the nth field. So dollar one means I mean it's from the previous slide. It's the same thing. So dollar one equals equals one means that we want the first field of the line to be equal to one, and we want the second field to match this regex, which matches uh, a username that starts with R and ends with T. Yes. The ampers, double ampersand means end. So uh, what we're doing here, we're just replacing this with like, instead of using wc-l, what we can do is we can keep a counter called rows, which is a variable, set it to zero at first. And then every time we see these, we add them by the first field, which will always contain one, right? Because we asserted it here. And then at the end of it, only at the end, we print uh, the content of variable rows. So uh, if we do that instead, so begin uh, set rows to zero. And then here, instead of bring this uh, rows plus equals dollar one, and then at the end, print the rows. And we're gonna get the exact same answer too, because yeah, it would only increase the counter whenever it encounters uh, this exact scenario. And then at the end, it would just print the rows. So these are like some other like special meaning. So yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Shell provides you with like many alternatives of doing the same thing. Although usually we don't really do this. Like we use awk mostly for like substitution, not substitution, but like filtering and stuff like that. And then we just use wc-l because that's just easier to think about of like, think easier to think about it as like piping things into different uh, specialized tools. Oh yeah, you don't really need a uh, semicolon, yep. Can I set print as variable in awk? I don't know. I don't think so because I'm pretty sure print is a reserved keyword. It's gonna be like confusing AF for awk as well. So what happens if I set this to print? Yeah, illegal statement. Because print is a function, you can't, you can't perform a yeah, assignment to it. Yeah, good. Uh, keep keep the questions coming. So uh, yeah, we can actually even get rid of grip and SED entirely because awk is actually a whole programming language in itself. But yeah, I'm just gonna leave it as an exercise because it's not gonna look nice, and that's probably not how you should think about like approaching data wrangling at all. So if you are actually interested in learning awk by yourself, so there's like this good resource that you can read.
and we can even do maths. So, uh, first of all, okay, if I replace this whole thing with talk print one, so it will print the number of times everything appears, right? And then I do paste every line with delimiter plus instead of comma, right? So if I do this and then I add that, now everything appears as a plus. And then you can see that this appears like a formula already, right? Like a mathematical formula. So if I then pass it on to BC, wow, it calculates this formula. So what is BC? We can do man BC. So it's, it's a calculator. Basically, it's a calculator. So we are piping a mathematical expression to BC. You can actually even run it directly. So you can do BC and then you can do like, what is one plus one? Two. What is, I don't know, two to the power of 10, 1024. So uh, what BC is able to do is that instead of taking directly things from standard input, it, you can also uh, like redirect things to like BC's standard input and then BC will output the, uh, the resulting thing. Mm, I don't know. I mean, I don't really use BC that much, but you can use dash L, which is a precision, I think. No, dash L is the standard math library. So you can use square root or something like that, I think. Oh yeah, just, just read the man. So uh, you can actually set BC's precision. So there's the integer part and there's the fractional part. Internally, numbers are represented as decimal. Like everything is in a manual, so you can just read it. Like I'm pretty sure it can do, it's not floating point, but it can do like non-whole number calculations by setting the position. I'm not sure where the position is. Yeah, you, you can set the length and the scale uh, somewhere. Yeah, I, I can't remember how to, how to do that, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, like the documentation is quite complete. So yeah, you, you can, it's just that by default, I think the fractional part is just discarded, which is why, yeah. All right, so maybe time for an exercise. So we can also actually use data ranking to make arguments. So, okay, let's find out what the XArc tool does, which we kind of did go through ish two weeks ago, but let's just go through it again. So man, man XArc. Build and execute command lines from standard input. So you might not understand, like, oh my god, like, what is this doing? So, uh, you can try like piping things. So, uh, echo, x arc echo. So okay, let us do this. Yeah. So you have this. So what happens if I do x arc echo? Who? It basically turns this into arguments. So that's what x arc do. So it takes in like the output of the previous command, and then. Uh, pass them as uh, the input, sorry, as the argument to the next thing. So like instead of instead of passing it as the standard input, it takes the standard input and then runs echo with this thing as the argument. So it's as if you run like echo, 8, 8, 8, 8 6, 7, 6, 7, 4, and so on and so forth. Then you will get like that result basically. So because we can pipe data to it, we can use data wrangling to make arguments. So now uh, inside your data set, if you change your uh, directory to TMP and you LS, then you can see there are actually like many, many of these things. There are like many, many files with like different formats. I mean, I, I just do this as like an example. So uh, what we want is we, uh, say like you want to delete files that matches this exact regex. So ASD.A space two digit numbers. Okay, so if y'all don't understand, you can always uh, copy paste this to like the debugger. So uh, ASD will just matches the character ASD literally dot matches any character. So like any single character and then matches against A literally, A space. And then zero to nine is basically a uh, digit. And then I can use this to repeat. So like match exactly two times. So, uh, yeah, so let, let's let's try doing this first. So like, 
uh, let's do ls and then pipe it to grip. Let's do this like one at a time. And you can see that, oh yeah, looks about right. These are basically like the files that you want to delete, right? Which is those things that matches this. So uh, starts with ASD, one letter in between, and then A and then space and then two digit numbers. So it wouldn't match like against one digit numbers, right? You can see that it just goes like straight away to two digits. And then what happens if we do XOX RM? Boom, suddenly just exploded and like cannot remove this, cannot remove that. So what's happening here? So let's look at say the last five lines. You can see this ASDY, AS, A, ASDYA 99, but you can see here that RM actually treats this as two arguments instead of like one whole argument with a space. So we are actually running into the exact same problem as last week, which is that uh, by default, bash would split argument by white space, which is problematic here because actually our file name itself contains a space and it's not really what we want. So there's actually a trick around this, which is to use the null character as a delimiter. So uh, we can, so in between grub and x arcs, what we can do is we can use tr to replace all the new lines with null character. And then we can use x arcs dash zero uh, to tell x arcs that, look, our delimiter is not white space, it's null now. So if you go to man x, man x arcs and then you search for dash zero, okay, by the way, to search, you can use slash. So like slash dash zero uh, does whatever I did just now. And then you can see dash zero or dash slash null. So input items are terminated by a null character instead of by white space. So yeah, let's do that. So replace new lines with nulls and then x arcs dash zero rm. And if you do that, boom, it succeeded. And if I ls, you should not see like files with these names anymore, right? I mean, basically almost everything is gone because uh, most files inside actually has that thing. So if I well, I'm in a git, so I can just revert it. I ls, and then you can see that basically like almost every file actually has that format, right? So if I do this, I ls, and you can see that like the ones left are basically those that don't match against these things. Oh, notice another thing just now. So if I, uh, if I run this without using tr, right, it will actually delete these files. And the reason being that besides ASDRA00, there's also ASDRA. And then uh, when you do this without the null, I mean, uh, null delimiter, it can delete against space. So be very, very careful when you use like XRX with RM inside because it may delete things you don't want to delete. So we, sh we don't actually want this file to be deleted, right? But when we do this and then, uh, Hold on, missing operands. Hmm. Okay, uh, if I do that again, git. I do this and then, yeah, no such file or directory, but it ac actually has removed like the file. So if I do that wrongly and then I do it correctly, and then I list, you can see that actually like these files have been deleted as well. Like the, the one whose name is just plain, uh, ASDYA, ASD, blah, blah, uh, because of that white space splitting. So it can be very, very dangerous. So sometimes when, before you do that, uh, maybe what you want to do is uh, pipe it to echo first, and then you can see that what it's gonna do. And then you can see here that it's definitely wrong. Well, in general, just be very careful when you do RM, basically. All right, some exercises. Uh, yeah, so actually the format, uh, if you go to man set and then go to substitution, can you replace slash anything else? Uh, you can replace it as long as you can make X arcs uh, understands it. So I'm not sure if X arcs can use, but I mean, now is the most common thing because uh, for some reasons, which I'm not gonna go into today, uh, null is okay. Basically, null is a marker for end of string, which is why we use null because it usually it won't appear anywhere. But if you use like a different delimiter besides uh backslash n, it would clash with something because like it might appear in your data set. 
but I'm pretty sure you can do that just by changing the delimiter. So like you can do dash D something else. So like say you want to replace like slash backslash N with like, I don't know, backslash T or something like that, you can. But the safest is now because simply because now the definition of a string uh, in C, which is what they implement Unix in, uh, is a non-terminated uh, set of characters. So if you have now, there's nothing afterwards. Yeah, you can. Uh, let's try that. So dash D bang, replace the new lines with a bang. So if I just echo first, I mean, echo won't do anything, but if I do RM, then you can see there's no error. So yeah, you can, but like, uh, try not to because the data set might contain a bang also. Okay, so uh, I was at man set substitution. Oops, substitution. Substitute whatever. Uh, S. Oops. Okay, it doesn't say it here. Hmm. Okay, but basically, uh, the format is actually uh, S slash the regex slash substitution and then slash this part would actually be the flex. Okay, actually. Let's look at, oh. let's look at the GNU one. I think this may be better. S slash, I guess we can Nope, okay, nope. Info set. Okay, never mind. Uh, yeah, but uh, basically there are these different things that are called flex. So uh, yeah, I think I'm sure you can go and Google them. So like uh, set flex. Uh, yeah, yep. So this is actually the GNU, like the official GNU uh, manual for set. So s slash, uh, okay. s slash, okay, yep. Let's use this that jumps directly into that command. Yeah, the S command. So you can see here that uh, the syntax is actually S slash the regex slash the replacement slash flex. So there are many different flex. Uh, and then they, yep, here. So it can be followed by the following flex. So there's like G, which is to apply the replacement to all matches instead of the first, uh, only just, just the first only. So, uh, there's also, I think the important ones are what I went through here. So like slash G, which would apply it multiple times. There's slash I, uh, which makes it case insensitive. Yeah, so make it match in a case insensitive manner. So these two are probably the most important ones. And uh, there's also another good website called regexer.com, which provides a, uh, which provides a, probably a much, oh my God, what is happening? Okay, uh, yeah, which pro probably provides, uh, oh. which probably provides like, uh, I don't know, it, it's up to you which interface you prefer. So uh, it does almost the same thing, but it doesn't really, yeah, uh, you, you can choose to use this if you want, but here you can change the flex as well. So there's like the different flex. So probably the most important one is like G for global and I for case insensitive. If you want a very quick uh, like overview of the flex. Now, you, you sometimes want to do like an in-place substitution and it's sometimes very tempting to do something like this, but it's a bad idea. So we can try that. Uh, so let's make a new file called input. Ah yeah, how you uh, made a good point, which is regex flex are JavaScript regex flex, which may differ. So the best thing is still to look at the GNU, the official GNU uh, ones. So I, I guess the ones that's universal definitely is G and I. So for example, like the multi-line and whatever details might be different. So let's have a file. So uh, 
let's say hello and hello. So uh, say what we want to do is, so if I cat input.txt, hello and hello, let's say we want to change hell into, I don't know, just a hell, uh, change hell, double L, double L into one L. So if I pipe to set, replace LL with a single L, right? You can see this, right? So I can redirect it to a file directly, input.txt, right? And you see that it succeeds, and then you want to see what is the new uh, content of input.txt, and it's just empty. So this this is what happens when you try to do input replacement, and then uh, you just do this. So the reason why this is happening is actually, I mean, you can even do do this like uh, even, okay, let, let, let's do this again, input.txt, and then put this again. Uh, so now input.txt has this. So what happens actually if I do this? I read the content of input.txt and then redirect to the input.txt again. And if I do this, you can see that input.txt would get again, uh, truncated again. So this is one thing that you, you should try to, uh, you should definitely avoid when you're doing shell things, which is like uh, reading from a file and redirecting it to the same file. The reason being that when you do this, it would actually try to open input.txt for output, which would truncate the file. And this happens before it runs cat and actually reads the file so that it would truncate the file first before then running this, which would definitely not output anything because it's an empty file now. And then like redirected output to an empty file, which will result in an empty file. So uh, you should not do this and you should have some kind of like a different file. So if I do this, uh, you should output the output of set. You should probably make it go to a different file. So like, I don't know, input.tmp.txt. And then after that, only move to the final destination. And then now you can see that everything's correct now. So like, uh, yeah, always, yeah. Remember this is like one pitfall that you shouldn't do. So this is not particular to set. It's actually for like everything that reads from the same file and output to the same file. Okay, second exercise that you may want to do. Find the number of words in this thing. So this should be available in every Unix uh, installation. So I'm on a Mac and there's something in this. If I go to my Linux box, well, my Linux box is weird. Let's go to another of my Linux box. So cat that there is it. Hmm. That's weird. It should exist. What package provides in Phoenix? Words. Words. Hmm. User dick words. Does it exist there? Nope. Hmm. Yeah, so, okay, let's just use this W American. So if you are running Ubuntu and it's not available, it's probably apt install W American and it will install that. Yeah, if you're running Ubuntu and it's not there, I mean, on Mac, it's there by default, but if it's not, then you can run that so that you can have this like list of files. So now if I go there and then, yep, it's there now. So, yeah, the package is W American. If you are on Ubuntu, oops. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I want is find the number of words in the dictionary in your OS that contains at least three A's and don't have a nest ending. So again, like we can go through the basic data wrangling. So we need the input source, which is uh, this file, right? So we can cut this. 
And then we need to do the filtering to get to this. And then you should know that on the very last one, you should have a pipe to WC-L uh, because you want to know the number of lines. So if you can filter to like the words that fulfills this criteria, so like three A's and don't have a nest ending, then you can definitely get it straight away. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to give you like a minute or so to try. This should be pretty easy given what we've gone through so far. Maybe the tricky one is like, how do you define this containing at least three A's as regex? Yep, so uh, Ice Water brought up a good point. So a lot of these commands, actually you can pass in the input directly. So you don't have to do cat pipe to something, you can do things directly. So for example, if uh, I want to, I want to uh, grab the lock for SSHD, like just now, I can actually just do grab SSHD lock and it would still do the exact same thing as if I do cat lock pipe to grab SSHD. So if you just want to do one thing, it might be cleaner to do that. Just like the command and then the very last thing you give the, in, the file as the input argument. I'm just gonna give like a minute more for that. So, uh, the the easiest one would definitely be the cat. This I'm sure you know. The last one must be a WC-L. And then what comes in between? All right, so let's go through the solution to this. So uh, the easiest one is actually to remove the nest. So grub actually has this nice flag called dash V, which is invert the match, small V by the way, because big V is version, small V for invert match. So it's a bit similar to the bang inside SE just now, which is like, we only want this to match, uh, we only want to print lines that doesn't match the pattern. So in this case, oops. In this case, what we want is this, and then uh, we type it to grip, but we wanted to print only those that doesn't contain nest. Okay, so okay, let, 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 let's look at the progress of it. So like initially there's like 235,000 lines that contains nest, and then if we remove nest and then we have like this 228878. And then uh, one way you can encode that containing at least three A's is by doing this. So three A's, and then there can be anything in between any of the A's. Then this would encode a regex for like any line that contains at least three A's. So if I do this, and if you're on Mac OS's word list at least, you should get like 6986 words. So I don't know whether Ubuntu uses the exact same word, list it doesn't so it's different so if you're on ubuntu then this should output uh 1214 lines as opposed to on mac os 6000 6900 lines if i have what was a 10a mm, well 
I mean, you might be better off using another tool, I guess. I mean, uh, hold on. Let's see if I can do this. I'm pretty sure I can do this. So uh, do this three times. Yep. So this one way to make it more like sustainable. So like you wrap this in this thing and then you say that I want to repeat the previous match three times. Yep. So if I do the same thing uh, on my Ubuntu box, then it should output the same. 12, 14. At least one. No, you just, you don't even need one three. You just need uh, like one, which is just this. Mm. Yeah, I guess you could do that, yeah. It would match a lot, but yeah. So that's that's the first one. Now for something that's more involved, what are the three most common last two letters of the? Okay, so for these words, take the last two letters. What is the most? What what is what? What are the three most common? Uh, like these two letters. So uh, if I actually print out like just this, then you can get like all these words right, which contains at least three A's, like Zephyr and three A's, uh, and doesn't have a nurse ending. What I want to know is if you take the last two letters, what's the most common out of all these uh, two letters endings? So I'll, I'll give you like a few minutes until 7.55, I guess, to try to solve this. But if you have any question, just like post on the chat. So yeah, the three most common last two letters of those words. And if you are able to solve this, then this, this one should come easily to you. not more than 2A, then you can do grab dash V of at least 3A, right? The inverse of at least three is not more than two. Yeah, so if I, okay, so for this, just add another dash V, then, oops. Uh, yeah, I mean, it should be the rest, right? So like, if you add this with like, the one that matched this, and then you add them together, it should match up to the number of words inside this. Mm, nice. Okay. So I didn't know that. So man group dash C. Yeah, dash C, that dash C would count only a count of selected lines. But I mean, uh, this is kind of specific to grip. So yeah, for grip, you can just run dash, just add dash C and it will print out like the number of lines that is selected by the pattern. But sometimes you want to do other things, like you want to use off or something like that. And I think. Yeah, what I'm mentioning here is just like the most generic way. But sometimes like if you are doing this for like a lot of, if you're calling this a lot of times, then like piping might be slower because you have to like start up the programs and everything like that. So yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a possible way of uh, not piping to WC-L, which is like pass-C to grip. 
Okay, so I wonder if anyone is able to do this one. Okay, so uh, I think the easiest way first is to actually, how do you print the last two letters of the words? Right? So another nice option in grep is actually dash O, which is to print only the matching part of the line. So you don't want to print the whole lines themselves. You just want to print uh, dash, uh, you only want to print like what actually matches. So uh, what I can do here is grab, uh, again, I want the modern regex, but I really want to print the matching uh, parts. So how do I match against only the last two words? So how to do it is I can do dot, dot, dollar, right? Dollar means match only the last word in the sentence. And then dollar, sorry, dot, dot would match only the last two letters. And then, uh, so if I print it here, boom. And then if you look at the explanation, so dot matches any character, any character, and only the end of stream. So if I do this and then I print out everything, you can see that it only now, now it only prints again, it only prints like the uh, last two letters. And then uh, if I do this and then I can do the same thing as just now, because now what you want is you want to find out three most common. So it's the same recipe. So just sort unique dash C, sort by the first field, and then print the last three. So these three are the three most common uh, two letter endings. And now if you want how many unique two letter combinations are there, then that's easy, right? You can just do unique, pass it to WC dash L, and then there are 150 unique uh, letter endings. And then uh, one useful trick, if you want to see what it actually outputs, but you don't want to like spam your screen, you can actually pipe to less. So if I pipe to less, then you can get this thing that you can like scroll up and down. And you can see like, uh, so like these are the uh, letter endings. All right, so for a challenge now, which combinations, like which two letter combinations actually don't occur in the sentence. Now this one is the one that's like very, very involved. So uh, yeah, I guess I'm just gonna give you all a bit longer, but if you have any question, like feel free to write in the group chat. So uh, I guess one hint that I can give here is that in my solution, I use this uh, command called com which would basically compare two sorted files line by line. But the unique thing that I want to use here is that I want to suppress the column. So that what I want is I would, okay, what I'm, what I'm doing is basically I would print out the whole possible two letter combinations, which you can do in bash. Uh, if you attend the previous session, you would know how to do that generate sequences. And then using this com, I would compare it against like the actual existing two letter combinations, do a diff, and then I only want the lines that are unique to uh, unique to this list of sequences. And that's how you would use com. That's like the basic idea of it. So uh, see if you can write it down as an actual uh, command. Uh, what do you mean by better? So the first exercise is the number of words that contain at least three A's and don't have nurse ending. It doesn't matter when you do the nurse. Uh, wait, what, what, what are you doing the grep dash E dash O dot for? Oh, sorry, it will be better. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. I mean, what I should, okay, uh, you don't have to do that. 
uh, what, what you can, yeah, yeah, invert removeness, not at the ending. Yep, yep. Uh, that's that's a good point. Uh, but you don't really have to do it. So what you can what you can do instead is okay. Wait, let me see. What did I do that? Uh, yeah, this one. Sorry, there's something wrong with this. And you're right. Group dash v nurse would remove nurse appearing anywhere. So what I need to do instead is to just do this. Boom, problem solved. Now we assert that the nurse would match only against the end of the line. So you don't you don't even have to do like the grab dash e dash o blah blah blah. So if you do this, then it should be the correct one. Yeah, which doesn't make any difference simply because apparently nurse doesn't appear in the middle of the sentence uh, of the word. I guess. I don't know, but yeah, uh, yeah, this, yeah, you're right. So like, if the nurse actually appear in the middle, then yeah, they will be wrong. Link of slides, sure. Yeah, th thanks for that. Yeah, uh, that, that was a mistake on my part, yeah. Okay, so let's change the base to this. Oops. How do I convert this into searching for words in a text? Uh, I mean, you can get it in. Only working for each line. Uh, does it matter? I mean, if you're searching for words, then it doesn't matter if it only matches for each line, right? I mean, the, 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 way, the way these tools work is that they would actually perform the uh, operation on each line simply because that's like the unit that they want to use it. But if you only want to search for the words, then it doesn't matter if it searches for each line or like for the whole document, right? Uh, unless you mean something else. How to open all two letter combinations existing in the text? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head a way to do this in uh in like off the top of my head like in shell. Like usually for this sort of things, you would probably use like other tools like you would just drop into Python or Ruby or that sort of thing. Okay, so I'm just gonna put out the solution that I wrote and uh, see if uh, and try to explain uh, like why I did what I did. So what you need is actually this. But yeah, so if you do that, then yeah, you, you get this like list of combinations that actually don't occur. So uh, sort unique, and then what I do is I use com. So, okay, let's do man com. So I pass it dash one and dash three because I want to suppress column one and suppress column three. So column three is the lines that appear in both files. I obviously don't want like the common ones, right? And also don't want the ones that only appear in, uh, I mean, other file and file two, depending on like how I pass my arguments. So in this case, my First argument is dash, which is standard input, which is the output of this previous command, which is the existing unique two letter combinations. So this I want to suppress, which is why I put dash one. And I also want to suppress the letters that appear in both. So dash three. And then for the second argument that I put in, I use this thing, which is actually inside the uh, previous week's shell scripting. So let me just, Open that and bring it to full screen. Five variables, which is process substitution. So what happens is that it would run the command inside the parentheses 
generate a temporary file, which is actually a file descriptor, and then it passes that file name into B as like this thing. So, uh, yeah, so uh, in our case here, what happens is that it would run the content of this and then puts that into a temporary file and it passes it as a second input to com. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm using glob to generate sequences. So if I do like echo a dot dot, oops, a dot dot z, it would actually print like a to z. So if I use both of them, that it would be like the cross product of these two things, which is like all the possible combinations. And then after that, I replace all the space into new lines because then there should be like the lines to comp that com would use to compare. And then the output of that would be actually like this long list of like the combinations that actually appear. Uh, they actually, sorry, they actually doesn't appear in our file. And then I, I use space just to uh, turn the new lines into a comma. So uh, hopefully uh, you will learn something out of uh, this exercise, which is like the com command, which is pretty cool and the process substitution. So I can, yeah, you can do this for like com for diff, which is a very, very useful way of like uh, comparing by like generating it on the fly and then passing it as a input file. All right. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. If you have any question, like feel free to uh, write it in the group chat. Like uh, I'll still be around for a while, but uh, Please uh, do fill in the feedback form. So um, I'll post the feedback form into the chat. So yeah, we want to hear from you. And uh, the next Hacker Tools will be two weeks from now, which is uh, 6th of October at the same timing, 6.30 PM. And it will be on web browser customization, online security, and privacy. Oh uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll still be around for a while. Is there a tool for interactive viewing of results of a pipe less? So uh, yeah, if I do this and then I use less, then this is sort of interactive, the results, right? Hello. Uh, unless that's not what you mean. Yeah, yeah, no, that's not what I mean. Hello? Uh, what do you mean? Yeah. So um, there is a tool, right, where you have it, when you have a long pipe like this, mm -hmm. um, as you enter the pipe for each component, it, it actually gives you the results interactively. So you can keep building and then backspace and then build the build the pipeline. Um, uh, um I, I can't even talk. like so like for this example, right? You do cat user share dig word. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. it after you do the first pipe, um it shows mm -hmm. the whole list of words. And then you can pipe and then you do a grab. After you do grab it shows the upper of grab. So you can visualize step by step as you build the pipeline. Okay, I'm not familiar with the tool yeah, like yeah. that. I mean, I've seen it before, but I forgot the name. So if you haven't seen it, then I, uh, yeah, sorry. Right, <laughs> yeah. I mean, usually what I do is I just manually build it one by one, like do yeah, 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 yeah. look at less and then, yeah. But yeah, that sounds useful. Yep. Uh... Well, I mean, you can do a hack. Oh, you want to find words with two A's. Uh, U slash G, I guess, for global. So, uh, okay, let's do that. So let's grab for words with two A's in them. So, I mean, this thing uh, is uh, new line separated, right? So we can do TR to new line so that everything's in one line now. Oops. Change new line to space. So everything's in one line now. Yep. And then you want words with two A's in them, not the entire line. To extract words with two A's in them. Uh I mean one hack that you can do is to just replace <laughs> the spaces with new lines. Then 
you can use the usual tools because the expectation is that what you want to, like the unit you want to operate on is actually in terms of lines, which is why even a dictionary file, even though they give words, they actually give like one word per line. I mean, like, I guess like the data wrangling here is like a very specific way, which is why uh, usually uh, like basically things that we use for, uh, like things that we use in Unix follows this convention of like having the smallest unit we want to operate on as like being aligned including like log files and that sort of thing. I mean, if you want to do like advanced string uh, operations, maybe bash is the wrong tool for that, basically. It's usually like very useful for like a quick and dirty way. So like you log it into a server and then you want to find, yeah, I think you should split up first into its own line, which I, I suppose this should do it, right? Like you replace the space with new lines. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that, that is actually useful. Okay, let's see. Hmm, okay, that's nice. Right, yeah. I mean yeah, I I I, I never used it. <laughs> yeah, I just run manually one by one. I mean uh you don't have to wait for everything it, for it to run completely, right? Because like, uh, which is also part of the reason why if you do sort and then head, like it is better to do like sort pipe to head instead of sort pipe to tail. Because I can't remember, but I think Bash will just terminate the program if the next part of the pipe terminates. So, uh. If you do like a blah blah blah, then you pipe it to pipe it to sort, and then you pipe it to head. Uh, say like dash n ten something like that. Uh, if head terminates after, because head would terminate after it receives the ten lines. Then what I think I think what bash would do is it would then terminate like what comes before that, so it would be faster. <laughs> yeah, I, I think side effective stuff would be really bad in up right, like RM. Or even like touch, yeah. But yeah, it's it's an interesting way to learn, I guess, as long as you don't do destructive stuff in it. Yeah, T would yeah, uh, T T would would basically print to both standard output and a file, which you can see from menti, return input, right to return output and file. So actually, actually, if you do, if you, if you do commands, it's usually better to use head instead of tail, simply because of, uh, it, it doesn't have to run unnecessarily over like the whole thing. And it would just like stop early. Yeah, uh, I think if there's no more question, I'm going to end the session by 8.15, so in two minutes time. Tail reads the whole first. It has to, right? Because tail means print the last end lines of the file. So it has to like go through everything and discard them and then only print like the number of lines that you want. It has to go through the whole input. Yep. No worries. Yeah, so if there's nothing by 8.15, I think I'm going to end the session. So yeah, thank you so much for coming, but please uh, fill in the feedback form. We want to hear from you. <laughs>